Hi, this is Wendy Artnowski, and we're going to try to do a, a very basic information tape on basic finishing techniques you can learn. This is not meant to uh, be so complicated that you won't have trouble following it. It's a basic tape, and we're going to try to cover the basic finishing things that will help you improve your finishing. Now obviously we all want to win the concourse award, be in the front row at the Nats, get 20 points, whatever. But you have to start someplace. You'll probably be starting by building profiles, like in the opening picture of this. Uh, there's a lot of little basic tips you need to know before you can move on to very complex type of finishes. A lot of basic information. These are pictures of planes that I've built and other people have sent me of their construction things. We'll try to use them during the video to give you an idea of just what these planes look like in the various steps up toward finishing. A lot of the information that you're going to need to know to improve your finishing is just basic information. It's not super high-tech stuff. To go from a very basic like a Monaco finish to an ice dope finish is going to take a little more time than monocoat, a little more effort, a little more work of course, but the rewards are you'll definitely uh, have a nicer appearing thing, nicer appearing airplane. These are just some of the pictures and I'm just going to run this by with the introduction, give you an idea of what my planes look like as they're being built. These are all old pictures. But they give you an idea, and the basic idea that I want to start with, at least thought one on this whole video, is that an airplane doesn't start out looking real slick. It starts out looking real rough, real crude, rough wood, and step one in any kind of a nice finish, step one is always going to be sanding the wood down flat. We'll refer back to these pictures a little later. Step one is always going to be get the wood flat. Without flat wood, and I'll explain this with a little bit of a diagram, without flat wood you will never get a light high gloss finish. You may get a high gloss finish but it'll always be a lot heavier than it has to be. There's a basic thought you have to think about here, and I want to make sure everybody has a little bit of an understanding of it, is you have to start with flat wood. You can't start with rough wood, and I'll make a little diagram to try to explain why. Now what we generally uh, accept as an acceptable amount of weight for a finish on a full-size stunt plane, let's say it's a typical 60 ship, uh, a Magnum, say, would be seven ounces. Now we accept that seven ounces is what legitimately will be the normal weight from when the plane is bare wood until it's buffed out. Somewhere in that area, seven ounces is an acceptable, normal plane should still retain its balance point in CG at seven ounces. At ten ounces, if we do a ten ounce finish, what happens is the plane becomes tail heavy. If we, if we do a finish, say, in monocoat, and it would come out at six ounces, usually the ship will be nose heavy. Sure, he knows how to spell. So, one of the first things to understand about finishing is finishing is going to affect the CG and the flying capabilities of the airplane. The CG is going to be affected. So we want to start with basic, basic numbers that we're going to be happy with. And these are the numbers for a full-size stunt ship. You can interpolate them down for a nobler. Let's say this might be five and a half. This might be seven, this might be four, something like that. But remember, 
the weight of the finish is built into the design of the airplane. When the nose and tail moments are calculated out and the wing area and the wing thickness, it assumes a finish is going to weigh roughly this amount. Now here's the reason it's important to understand that you need flat wood before you can start a good finish. If you start, if this being raw wood, and you start with a finish, the first thing you have to do is fill in all these gaps. You're either going to fill them in with filler, talc, dope, whatever. All this is going to be extra weight, needless weight, and it's going to be considerable. So the first thing we want to do is get the wood, maybe not perfectly flat, but as flat as possible. We don't want to start with rough wood, grainy wood. We want to start with it as flat as possible. Now what happens is you sand this down, and let's say you sand it, the final sanding, you block sand it with 400. I'm going to go over block sanding, I'm going to go over sandpaper. The goal one is to get the wood flat. If the wood isn't flat, you're going to have to fill in all these areas that aren't flat to get a flat finish. And flat is shiny. Shiny is flat. Anytime you can make a surface dead flat, light is going to reflect off it like on a diamond and reflect back and be shiny. If a finish looks like this, half of the light goes this way, half goes that way, half goes this it never shines. A diamond reflects light because it's perfectly flat. It hits a surface and it bounces back. Oh, if you're looking for a shiny surface, a shiny surface must be flat. To get this surface flat, we're going to do as much block sanding as we possibly can. Now, block sanding, for those of you that aren't familiar, remember this is an entry level video, basic equipment. We're not talking yet about the concourse. In the advanced finishing tapes, things will get a little more complicated and difficult. For basic, basic technology, the first thing that you want to try to get used to is the idea that things should be sanded with a block, a flat block. If you sand things by hand or with your fingertips, they generally look like that. If you sand them with a block, there's a better chance you're going to get that flat, light reflective surface, and you're going to avoid having a lot of little valleys filled in. Now what really happens, here's what really happens with wood anyway, is you sand wood perfectly flat with a block. You apply some dope and the wood does this. The wood swells, it gets wet and swells. If you don't believe it, go take a piece of 16th and get it wet and you'll see it'll shrivel up, shrink, warp. Now once the dope is applied, you have to go back and knock down the mountaintops fill in the valleys. You want to get it flat again. The second time it'll do it a little bit less. Each time you go back over a dope finish and block sand it down, what you're doing is making up for the wood gradually changing shape on a real real low level that normally if you didn't go back and sand over and over and over and over what you'd wind up with is this. A lot of valleys that were filled with dope. When you take this out into the sun these areas where there's a lot of dope are going to want to shrink and shrivel a lot more than here where the dope is thin and it's you're going to wind up with that at the end instead of a block flat sanded surface so this is an important concept and I hope I'm not tying up too much of this this little uh, video to, to get the point across that step one in all finishing is going to be to get flat surfaces that's a very important concept if you want to have nice finishes Hey, this is a typical sanding block. It's an old piece of balsa wood, typically a piece of wood that's too hard to use to make a wheel pant or a cowling. You can see it's all beat up. And what I do is take a piece, in this case it's sticky sandpaper, this is 60 or 80 grit paper, and actually it's, it's stuck on with the glue that's on the back of it. And you can see you can peel this right away. This is for, let's start with the basic shaping. You can buy these, this is 80 grit, buy these in any body shop supply store. They have glue on the back. If you want to use sandpaper that doesn't have sticky back, you can just spray contact cement on the sandpaper and on the block 
When you want to remove the sandpaper, just put the block in the oven at about 120 degrees for two minutes. The sandpaper will come off real nice and easy. It won't destroy the flat surface on the block. Again, what you want to do if you're going to do real rough carving, this, this is a, a block that would be for rough shaping. And this is just one of many sanding blocks to do your sanding with. This would be a typical block that you would, you could see the contour here. This you'd be using to do fillets. You would take a piece of sandpaper by hand, hold it here, wrap it around, sand the fillet, move the sandpaper just a little bit, sand, move the sandpaper. This way you'd use the whole piece of sandpaper. Constantly move the piece a little bit, do a little more sanding. This would get you a nice radius edge and a fillet. A lot of people that start out building banshees and twisters and prowlers have no idea about sanding blocks. I'm going to use a couple of minutes of this video up to describe sanding blocks. This would be a sanding block used to get in a corner or an area where you normally couldn't fit your fingertips, where the wing joined the body, where the flap fillets were. This is a piece of eighth inch light ply. Again, it has a piece of sticky back sandpaper just glued right to it. Nothing high tech here, this is basic stuff. I like to have different shape and size blocks for getting in different areas. And I'm just going through my box here to take out ones I want. This one has a real big edge. Now this would be to get inside, inside of a hollow top block. When you hollow a top block out, you could get in there with that. That would be what that one was for. Okay, another couple just to get an idea. This is a nice flat one, a nice long one for getting in on areas. One of the best ones I have and use all the time is a Ringmaster leading edge with a piece of balsa wood glued to it or a piece of plywood, piece of sandpaper, and I can get in the top block way back by the turtle deck. A great one is a hacksaw blade because it allows you to get way in the back the back of a block where the elevator is, you can get in there, get some rough sandpaper. All you need to do is tape the sandpaper right to the hacksaw blade. You can get way in. And because a hacksaw blade is tempered steel, it allows you to get way in where you normally couldn't. Dowels are especially good. This is a, you can buy these in hobby shops, all different size dowels. Just wrap, you can see how a piece of sandpaper is wrapped around. Wrap it around. Put tape around the edge and you can get in around fillets, cowling holes, needle valve holes. Real helpful. Another good thing, this is a real good one, brass tubing. This is one that I used, I just got done using, in fact, I carved out a cowling the other day and I was making the scoop, getting in and trying to get it all nice and level inside. This is real handy to have. Another type of block that you can use from time to time is a soft block. Now this is a piece of styrofoam left over from a wing core. You can see it's soft. It's like a sponge. For doing round leading edges, round top blocks, different areas where you want a little bit of radius in a leading edge, this is nice. And I usually have these in all different sizes and shapes. Some have some little bows in them. I always have a block for big fillets. This would be the wing fillet. The small one would be the tail. I always have some blocks that have this kind of a cut on them and I can get in corners now. If there's, for instance, where the landing gear joined the body, I can get in there like that. Wheel pants, this is real handy for. Again, you can kind of improvise. There's no set rule here. Any piece of plywood you can radius the edge on, wrap a piece of sandpaper on and have yourself a nice little sanding tool. Having sanding tools is an important thing to have. That's one of the main things you need to have if you're going to do this kind of finishing. Now this, is kind of, this is a top block that I'm working on right now. And you can see how hollow it is. Kind of sanded inside. I have the turtle deck carved right in there. And again, what's real handy now, some of these sanding blocks that have the edge, I can get in here with this motion. Okay, the one with the real big curve, I can get in here and kind of hollow this out with 80 grit, 70 grit. I'd use a Dremel tool, an X-Acto knife, I can get in there. Whenever I see a block getting real thin, and the way you see if it's thin, you hold it up to the light, I mark it with some little red ink so I don't go back over that. A lot of times you'll slip with the gouging knife. Yeah, and as you get to the back, now as you get to the back, you can pick this up with 
the one from the Ringmaster Leading Edge. And then right at the very back, it's going to be hard to get in the back there. You can get in with the hacksaw blade. You can see that the material comes right out like snow. Very easy to get it out and get it nice and hollow. Get it even. You wind up with a real nice top block without a lot of work. This is a top block from a typical cardinal type of plane. We can get these blocks down on the 20 grams. Have a couple that are 16 and 17. I think Midgley's was 17. You can get them down in weight. And anyway, so they're super light. Now you want to start on this kind of a finish. It's this finish here that you really want the block for. When you're doing this kind of a contour, let's see, you want to put that radius in there. Now, when you get up to the front here, you want that block that has the little bit of an edge on it to get right up in there. Get that corner, get that edge with sandpaper. Okay? You want to get that edge in that corner right in there. So what I do, I have an IBM card box that I keep all my sanding blocks in. Sanding with a block, I guess you could sand 99% of the airplane with a block most of the time. It'll come out relatively flat. You can keep your box, all different blocks in it, nice and neat. I guess the next logical part of this discussion would be the sandpaper itself. There's a lot of different kinds of sandpaper. And we'll just go over what the basic ones are, starting with the roughest. These are parts of these stick-on uh, auto body. This happens to be 80 grit. By the way, for anybody that doesn't know, this is an entry-level video. 80, <clears throat> the smaller the number, the bigger the grits, the bigger the little pieces of sand or whatever they are using on their silicone carbide to do the cutting. So, if you have a big number, it's smooth. A small number, it's rough. This would be basically for rough cutting and carving. Another nice along that line is these little sanding belts like this. And you can buy these in Sears Roebuck. This is made for a belt sander. They come in all different grits. What you do with this, I'll just focus up on my table here. And you can see I have a piece on the edge of that table glued right to the table. Piece is glued right to the table itself. Makes a nice flat sanding surface for doing some rough sanding. There's all different kinds of sandpaper. As we go down in grits, the numbers are going to change. You're, go, you're going to see here we have, in this case, 320. This is 3M paper. It's gold in color. It's excellent for sanding balsa wood. The best place to buy sandpaper is always at a body shop, supply house. If you don't live in a big city, uh, you're going to wind up paying hardware store prices. It's always cheapest to buy sandpaper in what's called sleeves. There's a hundred sheets in a sleeve. Believe me, if you're with the hobby long, you're going to use hundreds of sheets of sandpaper. There's no way you're going to use two or three sheets and finish an airplane. Okay. Keep in mind, now the number has gotten, in this case, this number has gotten bigger. The grid of the paper has gotten finer. We can go all the way down now. I think we should have some 600. Now 600 would be for sanding finishing material. This is really 400 is the the, uh, the biggest number I use on wood. 600 is used for sanding finishing material. So again you can go right down. This is gray paper. This is called no load. Again this is a good for doing wood. It sands filler real nice, the gray paper. I'm trying to just put a little sample of each kind. The black sandpaper of which this is this is 400. I see I've torn it off. What happens to this that's bad is see how it it, it kind of makes rough edges when you, when it's not wet. So I don't suggest using this for anything but sanding finish. Then you have the 1200 paper. Again, this is microfine 1200. This is used for sanding clear and finishing material, not wood. And there's all kinds of little Aside from this, there's all kind of little reels and grits and discs. One of the things to keep in mind is none of this stuff is fancy. A lot of people start out with the idea in mind that they want to have a hospital ward or a, a nuclear facility to, to build model airplanes. A place that's acceptable to build model airplanes doesn't have to be expensive. 
It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to even be neat and clean. Some people's shops that I've been to are just like a complete pig pen. And they get along fine and they build contest winning airplanes. My shop is not that fancy, but a lot of airplanes get built here. Again, this is how I buy sandpaper. These are sleeves. A hundred sheets in a sleeve. That's the most economical way to buy sandpaper. And if you look around the shop, you'll see this is a typical shop here. There's nothing real fancy about it. There's nothing elaborate. It can be relatively uh, simple. It can even border on being sloppy and it's okay. Another thing worth mentioning, anytime you're going to sand wood, good idea to wear a mask. These are real cheap. You can buy them in body shop supply houses under five dollars. Excellent. When you're done at the end of the day, take a vacuum clean and vacuum the outside. Try not to breathe in too much balsa dust or filler dust. Good idea not to breathe any, of course. These are a cheap way of saving your lungs. Now, one of the concepts you have to understand if you're going to do dope finishing is that all thinners are not equal. If you look at a can of thinner, this is 3613S, acrylic lacquer thinner. It shows you what temperature. In this case, it's 55 to 65 degrees. Various types of thinner can be used for various jobs. One thinner is the best compromise of all is 3608S. This is the number of thinner. This is spot repair thinner. This is what you would use to do a repair on a plane. And I just want to show that there are different kinds of thinners. Okay, this is what you have. You have 3608S thinner. This is the best thinner. If you're only going to have one thinner in your shop, have this. This thinner would be used for an example when you wanted to touch up a little spot where you went through you'd want to use spot repair thinner. Spot repair thinner, if you used it for the whole finish, when you took the tape up, you'd pull the paint up. You don't get a good mechanical or chemical adhesion. You do get an ability, this thinner doesn't go down into the finish, loosen everything up and make a big mess for you. You're going to do general finishing for all SIG products, 3608S. Spot repair, 3613S, always a good choice. Now, obviously there's other thinners. There's all kinds of thinners available. If you intend on using any Aerogloss at all, you're going to find out you have to use all Aerogloss thinner. It's really expensive. And I won't go into what the results are. A lot of people I know personally, from Billy Suarez to uh, no sense even making a list, have had a lot of trouble with the new Aerogloss. New Aerogloss is not like the old Aerogloss. Some of it's been changed. It seems to shrink too much, and it definitely has a tendency to crack. So we're going to, I hope, stick with, uh, in my finishing uh, shop, all lacquer products and basically SIG dope for 99% of the work. Now if you're doing any open bay work, you're going to want to use super coat to shrink the finish. Two or three coats to shrink the open bay tissue. If there's no open bays on the plane, no super coat. You're going to want to use all light coat. Light coat shrinks a lot less. Now, a lot of bad experiences, and, and not made to embarrass anybody, but uh, a local East Coast flyer, in fact, two of them that I know of, decided that it was easier to buff out planes if they were sprayed with super coat. And he found that, yes, it did buff out a lot easier, except the plane shriveled up like a prune after six months. The ink lines even got crooked. It shrank so much. So if you use super coat, you only use it on and never get it anywhere there's a fillet. Do not put this by fillets for all the money in the world. You want to use all light coat. By the way, all SIG colored paint is light coat. It's all mixed from light coats. Another neat little trick, if you look on the back of the can, or if you look in a Pro Stun catalog, it has a real basic good way to get a good basic finish without a, without a whole lot of high tech. The only thing I suggest, if you're going to do a lot of finishing, SIG thinner, by the way, is, a, is about equal to 3608S. It's a little bit hotter of a thinner. It takes a little bit longer to dry. If you're going to use light coat and 3608S, 
great. There's almost no chance you're going to have a problem. When you start mixing and matching this over that, that over this, uh, there's all kind of chances that you're going to have a problem. Right here is the three basic things you need to do nice finishing. It never need to get more complicated than this. Now one of the other products you really should buy as long as you're going down to the body shop supply house is this is the equivalent of Prepsol. I like this a little bit better. It's wax and grease remover M600. This is a product you put on a paper towel and wipe after you're done sanding the plane and it takes every fingerprint, every bit of grease and oil off. Not too expensive, a good idea to have. It's real handy for cleaning your hands at the end of the day. Tools, it's a, it's a great degreaser and you can paint right over what's left. Good idea as long as you're going to get serious about finishing, pick some of this or prep soil up. Some people like to use tack rags. I don't like tack rags. I would rather use this. Now another thing, right here I have a five gallon can of 3608S. If you buy five gallon cans, you can cut the price down to about half. So keep in mind, uh, if you're going to do a lot of finishing, or if two or three of your buddies are going to get together and do finishing, buy a five gallon can and split it. Another thing, you'll see there's all little jaws of what's left over when I'm done painting. These are all jaws. Notice that I have each jar, in this case it's light coat. I have them marked with what's in the jar and what kind of thinner. In this case it's acrylic and it has 3608S. Every jar that you use should be marked as to what's in the jar. Now you're probably looking at these jars and saying, oh my god, is it sloppy and disgusting. What a mess this guy's shop is. Well, keep in mind this shop is not a show place. I know a few people that have a show place shop and it seems like they wind up spending more time playing with their shop than building airplanes. This is a shop where airplanes get built. We generally build 10 to 15 stunt ships a year here. Parts or all of myself and about six or six or eight other people that work in this shop build airplanes. This is a production line type of place. So we have to keep track of what's in each jar, what's in each can. And it's a good idea if you do that with a little tape label showing what's in each can that you're going to use. And if you spend a lot of time making a nice neat shop or having all your jars in order, well that's nice too, but don't let it get in the way of building an airplane. Now we talked about a couple of the basic things you need to do nice finishing. You need flat wood. Start with a flat surface. You need to know a little bit about dope a little bit about sandpaper, a little bit or a lot in this case about thinner, and a little bit about degreaser. Now if you look down at this list what you see is it's not that involved. It's not that complicated. There are not that many things to know about. This is the big one. And this is the one we're going to spend some time on right now. Now, if you look into to see, actually physically see, a stunt ship, an open bay ship being brought from bare wood right up through, buffing it out, the Nobla video, there's eight cassettes, it's lengthy, it's involved, I would suggest you check that out. We won't try to do that in a two hour video. If you want to know about foam wing, gear in a wing type of finished airplanes, you can check out the Sidewinder video. Now the Sidewinder video shows this exact airplane right here, which I flew at the, uh, the 90 Nationals. It shows this whole plane going from bare wood right up to final buffing, and the last video is actually the flying and the trimming of the airplane. Now, the purpose of photographing all of those spray sequences and dope mixing sequences is just so that you can get a rough idea, if you need to or want to, of every step that's involved from the spraying and, and mixing of the paint and sanding. Just to pan around the shop here a little bit and get a look at what's going on. Keep in mind you have five or six people that build in this shop constantly and it's it's a busy place and usually it's a sloppy place because there's a lot of people working here people come from uh, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania uh, Delaware, all over the place to spend weekends here and build so I have to kind of organize it in a way that makes sense to me and in this case uh, we have three people building here 
and we got to kind of try to keep track of what they're doing and who's using the sandpaper and who stole the last of the thinner. Anyway, if you want to see a whole ship from start to finish, the finishing is probably the last four or five videos. Uh, the Nobler shows some of that too. Now I remember a friend of mine telling me, who's a dentist, that there was a good way to tell if you had a good dentist or not by how long he took to do the job. And good finishing takes time. That's a good, a good basic rule to know and to remember. What happens if you go fast? You usually wind up heavy, sloppy, or both. If you take your time, you're usually going to wind up with a light ship, flat ship, flat wood surfaces, and it's going to be the best, the best of both worlds. So, I'm willing to take a little time when I set out to do some finishing. I don't look at it like we're having a race. Billy Wurwich had a great a great uh, little saying that I always remember. He says, we're not having a race. We're not having a race to see who can get done first or to see who can build eight or ten ships a year. Even though I do build a lot of ships, I try to put a lot of time and effort into each one. Good finishing takes time. It's a concept that you have to deal with. So now we have a little idea of what the basic tools for basic finishing are. And keep in mind this is all pretty basic. We want to start with a real nice flat piece of wood. Step one. On that piece of wood we'd like to put, and I'm just going to do this with layers, I like to put three coats brushed on of light coat. That gives me a surface that's three coats. I have three coats of clear dope. At the end of that time, that surface has gotten like this. It's gotten a little wavy. So I'll sand it down. I'll block sand it if I can with 400. I'm not going to try to sand through all the coats. I'm going to try to just scuff off the top coat get all the fuzz off. Then on the whole airplane, I'm going to put double O tissue and I'm going to attach it with more light coat. Light coat thin 5050 with 3608S. So now I have a coat of tissue over everything. And I'm going to put three more coats brushed on of light coat. At this point in time, this should start to look a little shiny and I'm going to sand it down because again the surface is swelled and shrunk it's going to look a little lumpy I'm going to try to block sand it down and I'm going to put two coats on of talc filler now you can buy the talc filler from light from uh, SIG or you can mix your own one-third dope, one-third talc one-third uh, thinner 3608S and brush on the filler two coats sand it down so now you have a surface of wood that's got eight coats of dope all together up to the end of the filler. You have eight coats in this, this layer. It's been block sanded three times or more if you want to defuzz it. You should have a nice flat surface here and you should be able to candle it. Now candle it means you hold it up to the light and see the light reflecting off of it. Like you would look at a diamond if you hold a diamond up to see the sparkle. From this point on, this whole thing has been brushed. The reason you don't spray it is you don't want to use a lot of thinner. This whole amount of the finish has been brushed. From the end of the filler on, you spray. This coat here would be a spray of clear, light coat of course, and then on top of this is going to be a spray coat of silver. We're now up to 10 coats of paint. By the time we've gotten to the end of the silver, we have 10 coats of paint. 
We should have the silver relatively flat, smooth, and this airplane should look like it's made out of aluminum. If it doesn't, what you do is sand off all the silver, go back down to the clear, and spray another coat of silver. If it's still not right, sand off the silver and spray another coat. Spray, sand off the silver, spray another coat. <clears throat> if you look at the Sidewinder video or the Noble video, you'll see I went three or four coats of silver before I was happy. I'm actually using the silver, actually using it as filler. And you go back, forth, back, forth, even four or five times until it's perfect. Fix all the little mistakes, dap over any little divots that you have. So, what you have, you have 10 to 12 coats of paint, they've been sanded, and you have this, this material here, from here to here, is called substrate. A body shop, a place that painted for a living, when I painted motorcycles for a living, and boats, this bottom filler, this base, is called substrate. Developing a nice substrate for your paint job is a very important thing to do. Now with that nice, a nice flat substrate, probably that spelt wrong, but who cares? Everybody knows I don't know how to spell. I know how to finish and fly, not spell. Substrate. We're going to put on colored paint. There's a lot of choices here. You can use over that substrate any kind of acrylic lacquer, which is automotive paint. Automotive paint will tend to be heavy. If you decide to use automotive paint, make sure you use Flexol. Make sure you put fish eye killer in it. But anyway, for this point, let's, let's just do a typical dope finish. We want to paint the airplane white. So, this is a silver. It looks like an aluminum airplane. We spray on a coat of white. One coat. This would be one way to do a finish, and we'll go through a couple of different ways. I would add extra pigment to this. For anybody that, that has never used extra pigment, this is what it looks like. This happens to be a yellow can. You put one can of this in 16 ounces of paint, and the white will generally cover in one coat. If you don't know what the jars of Flexol look like, Fish Eye Killer, Flexol is made by Dave Brown. You can buy it in hobby shops, or you can buy it from Pro Stun Product. Put some of that in the paint. Fish Eye Killer, if you have normally uh, dirty shop conditions, you can get a jar of fish eye killer. That'll last a lifetime. One jar is like a forever amount. Spray the white. When you're all finished spraying the white, and I assume everybody's letting each coat of dope dry 24 hours. I like to let the dope dry out because the thinner gas is off. If it's as white as you hope it'll be, fine. You can then mask off your trim spray out the trim. You can back mask the whole airplane. Get the trim on there. I like to do the Letra sets. By the way, if you're not, if you've never used Tom Lay Letra sets, you can get them from Pro Stun Products or from Tom. They're super good Letra sets, save you a lot of time. Ink lines. There's a tremendous dissertation about ink lines on the Sidewinder video because you'll see how many ink lines are on it. This then becomes from the substrate up to the point that we have all our ink lines on the plane. I'll call this the finish. We have a substrate, we have a finish, and the top is going to be the clear coat. Now, if you've let each coat dry out 24 hours gas off right up to this point in time where you're going to do the clear. This should be in really nice shape and have everything except it'll still be dull and you want to get some clear on there to make it shiny. Now here's your beautiful finish. I'm going to exaggerate this for the purpose of, uh, of showing what to do here. Is this would be what a letter set would look like if we sliced a pie view out, and this would be what an ink line looked like if we did a cross section. What I do is I take the first coat of clear 
and spray over the ink line and spray over the Letraset with very, very little thinner. If you use a lot of thinner, it's going to melt the Letraset. It's going to smear the ink line. So I put on over the Letrasets and over the ink lines maybe 10 coats of clear with an airbrush. It's best to do this with an airbrush. Put the next coat on, put the next coat on, on and on and on. Now you've built up a little layer of clear. There's no clear on the airplane yet. I let this dry out a good, a good two or three days because this will be very jello-y and very soft if it's done right. And then I would spray on, my first coat of clear would cover everything, second coat of clear cover everything, third coat, each coat is going to go down. I would put three coats of clear on the plane. At that point, I would set it aside to dry, maybe a week. A week would be a good amount to let it dry. Then I would block sand this dead flat, sand it by hand or block sand it with 600 sandpaper and try to get it back to being flat. If you go through any spots, of course, you can still touch it up. It's not a problem. And then I would put on three more coats of clear. This would then get sanded with 1200 paper and buffed with Gorham Silver Polish. Now, if you go back and look at this, there's a lot of little tips and tricks, things that'll make your life easier. One of them, the biggest single thing you'll notice is dope is a pain in the ass to sand. If you try to sand silver dope before it's dry, whenever you spray silver, try to let it dry a week instead of a day. That'll make it easier to sand. Anytime you're going to sand silver, let it dry extra days. Another trick when you're dealing with silver is take the can off the hobby shop shelf, don't shake it, pour off the top one third, and that's usually not going to have any pigment in it, and you'll wind up with extra pigment at the bottom. Take one third of the paint out. So you're really only going to use two thirds. This will have all the extra pigment in the bottom. Use the two thirds, thin it normally. That'll make for a lot nicer silver job. A lot easier sanding too. Anytime you're going to Anytime you're going to deal with sanding silver paint, if it's still tacky and wet, you'll look at the sandpaper and there'll be chewing gum and you'll make a mess. You'll know right away you didn't let it dry enough. Always good to let the silver or the colored paint dry by a heating vent. If you have a heating vent in your house, like right now it's about 18 degrees outside and you can set it up to dry at a heating vent. Now, if you see where I have this ship hanging, what I always try to do is have the ships hanging near a heating vent. Right over here I have a heating vent. Lots of nice hot air. You'll see there's a hook right here. When paint is drying, I hang the plane up by the lead outs right in front of the heating vent. If you get that paint too hot, what is definitely absolutely going to happen, you're going to see little bubbles in it. I've heard of people trying to dry planes with hair dryers. That's a typical symptom of a hair dryer job. It's a problem, you're going to ruin the finish. So you just want it warm, just a little warmer than room temperature. You don't want it hot. You don't want to use a hair dryer. I suggest forget about hair dryers. If you have a dehumidifier in the house, run a de now here, here's my dehumidifier. Pro Stunt dehumidifier here. Run it constantly while you're finishing the plane. You can see my cellar floor, even though it's normally wet, I normally have water here. My cellar floor is dry. Run the dehumidifier, pay for the electricity. So what? It'll only be less money you have. And eat lots of pizza. That's, that's definitely part of uh, doing good finishing because you get all that oil on your hands and then your finishing uh, gets sloppy and slimy. I won't mention any names who did that to my last plane. Stifle. Now you can see this is in another part of the house. Here's a heating vent. 
And these are two planes that are drying. These are two ships that I'm painting right now. This guy is drying. This guy is being wet sanded out right now. Now, for anybody that doesn't know what wet sanding is, the only time I would suggest using wet water sandpaper on your plane is when you're sanding the clear. If you wet sand before there's enough clear on the plane, you'll let the water and moisture get in by the hinges and down by the, the open bays, and you'll have a problem. Uh-oh, somebody didn't wet sand the cat. Wet sanding clear only. Now this is a ship that right now today we're sanding the clear out. In fact, when I'm finished with the video, I'm going to finish sanding the clear. This is the 1988 plane, the Cardinal. And this is the, uh, the plane that was awarded 20 appearance points. Of course, uh, it may or may not be 20 points when I get done with it. This plane had extensive repairs. R ribs had to be replaced, landing gear had to be replaced, stab had to be fixed. So uh, we're hoping that this will be the backup plane for this year coming up. And uh, it's a Toon Pipe 60 ship. We're sanding out the clear now, and it's uh, about the middle of January 1991. So this would be a good plane to uh, give a look at while it's in this condition, so that when you see it maybe later on in some future video and it's all buffed out, you can get an idea that it's sitting right by this heating vent drying out. Now what I do, I put a plate on the rug so that the wet paint doesn't stick to the nose. And I usually put a little piece of wax paper, I don't know what happened to it here, it had a piece yesterday, so that the wingtip can rest down. I just lay it down. Again, this is a repaired airplane. And we're sanding out the clear on this guy today. Now I guess since most people that would be starting a hobby at an entry level would be dealing with probably wouldn't start off their career with foam wing airplanes. They'd start with ringmasters, noblers, ski ski noblers, whatever. Let's talk a little bit about things you can do to make a built up wing a little bit easier and more pleasant to deal with. Number one, these are wings that Jimmy Casale was making. I have a nice picture of them here to use for reference. This is before the sheeting is on, obviously this is after the sheeting is on. What you'll notice though is where the cap strips are. I'm going to do a reference chart on this. Just get a little look at what this is. And what I'm going to do is draw this out in a format that I think will be easier than using a photograph. Okay, if you look at an open bay wing, and what you're going to wind up with is boxes, and these are called open bays, where there's nothing but tissue, there's no wood underneath the tissue. It can be any amount, it can be like a ringmaster, like a Gieske Noble, or any, any type or shape or whatever, uh, an open bay where there's tissue. Now what you want to please keep in mind is a side view of this is going to look like this. These open bays are going to definitely have a little bow and it's going to be sharp edges at each cap strip right here. Any place that the tissue ends, and wood begins, we're going to refer to as an edge. So that if you look at any open bay wing, a typical open bay wing, this is going to be an edge. This is an edge. This is an edge. Now, if you start out and take, take that typical wing and get all of these edges radius down nice, if every one of those edges has a nice radius to it, the tissue will span it and what you'll see is from, from the side view it'll look like waves. The light will reflect nice and smooth like facets in a diamond. That's why an I-beam wing looks so nice in the sun. But you must radius all of these sharp edges where the ribs would be coming up. 
What I do is I sand the wood, you start with that, and I'd sand a little bit of a radius into it, dope the whole edge two or three times, and then sand the doped wood before you even cover it with tissue so you don't have a sharp edge. The tissue is always going to rip right at an edge. You're going to sand through, buff through, whatever, right at an edge. That's the problem spot. Now, a trick for getting around that. This is a, this is a striping brush. A normal brush would have short hairs like that. This has very long hairs. Okay, one of the ways you can get around having those weak areas is by taking, and you'll see this on a Nobler video a million times, is to go over all of the edges, paint all of the edges, 10, 15 extra coats of dope. So what happens is, a cross view would be, here's the wood ending, and here's the tissue starting. This coat of dope would go up over the tissue. This coat of dope for the tissue would go up over the wood. This would go up over here. This would go up over here. You have interlocking coats of paint. Then you also have extra coats of paint. Much exaggerated. But what you would have is 10 coats of extra paint right on the edges themselves. So that the edges, if you put 10 extra coats on the whole wing, the wing is going to be like a brick. You only want it around the edges where you're vulnerable. And on a built-up wing, that's an easy way to save weight and yet not go through on the corners and edges. That's one of the best tricks in the book. If you need more details on that, needless to say, the Nobler video details that out. Any tails, rudders, body sides, like on a Gieske Nobler where you have those holes in the body, do the edges on the holes in the body. Any place where you have open silk span running into raw wood, that's the way to make it a real professional job and not, have, not be vulnerable that it's always going to break. Talk about some basics. Spraying. Dope. I guess the biggest question I've ever heard when I used to write the flying models column and people would write in all the time and ask, or even now, how much thinner? Always start with 50% thinner, and that should be 3608S, 50%. This is, this is your clear coats or your finish. Dope. Always put in Flexol and a drop of fish eye killer. Okay, this is this is this will be referred to as the mix. This mix, and that's exactly what this is, there's four elements in a mix, will be relatively thick. It'll be on the thick side. But now that you have this mix, and it's good to keep it in a jar or whatever, you can always add thinner. To spray it. What I try to do is try to spray it around 25 pounds per square inch with your compressor. Add thinner until you spray and when you set up a stripe to spray the edges aren't all sandpapery. This is called overspray. Start with 25 pounds. If you can get away with it, go to 20. 20 is even better. The less pressure you use, the better off it'll be. And get a nice smooth coat. If you don't have a compressor, there's a lot of ways you can do this. Number one, you can rent compressors on a daily basis. In a New York City area, it's about $20 a day to rent a small compressor. You can spray from an inner tube on a car. That's another way. And there's different setups, various setups to use an inner tube, especially if you live in an apartment and neighbors don't want you running a compressor. But the best thing is to get a small compressor. Try to run 20 to 25 pounds. Try to run maybe ultimately 60 percent thinner would be a good number ultimately. Okay, now where this gets complicated, here's exactly what happens that gets people confused. Warm weather. What happens in warm weather is, when it's warm, 
and humid, the dope skins over. You lay out the dope, it flows on, and the top layer skins over. And you've trapped moisture underneath. And it looks like milk. I'm sure everybody that's ever done a finish knows that feeling. It goes, eh, looks like milk. Now, one of the ways what's happening is the surface layer of the dope is drying. You're trapping little bubbles of moisture underneath. When it's warm, it skins faster. When it's humid, there's more moisture. So the warm and humid condition, bad. To get away with it, you can add retarder. Adding a little retarder will, will let it skin over slower and let more of the moisture out. Retarder. Keep in mind, if you put too much retarder in, what retarder does, it constantly goes down and softens the finish. Now, good friend of mine, Bill Rich. Really good friend. Can't say enough about this guy. He's been a student of the event for a long time. Took a perfectly good airplane and he was going along and these are pictures of my plane by the way and going along doing a trim and going along doing a trim I don't think he'll mind me telling this story going along masking off the plane going along doing a trim and he got to a certain point and he decided alright it's really coming out great hey it's really coming out even better and he went down to the local body shop and he bought some high gloss thinner so here you have old Bill Rich. He used high gloss thinner. And he was in Florida. It was hot and it was humid. And what happened? The first coat went on and it was shiny. Second coat went on a little bit too soon. It was shinier. Third coat went on and the plane melted. Like a candle. The plane literally melted, the dope rolled off the edges, the inclines all got fuzzy, the electrosets all melted. High gloss thinner if you use too much or retarder. These two items, when used in moderation, can help this condition. If used in excess, you will melt, you will have nuclear meltdown a la Bill Rich. Anybody that doesn't believe me, feel free to call Bill Rich up. He's a member of Pampa and he's a super good guy. Ask him what a horror he turned his one plane into. Now, what Bill did is showing that he had some intelligence is right away he got on the phone and blamed me. Hollered at me, cursed at me, said I ruined his plane, I don't know what I'm doing. And I knew he was right, so I told him how to get around it. What he did, he took, I believe, five gallons of thinner and five rolls of paper towels. I don't suggest you try this, but it did work in his case, and it's a good tip. And he literally soaked the towel in your bare hand and wiped the finish until or throw it away. Another towel, wipe the finish, throw it away. Soak it, wipe the finish. What happens is because the finish was soft from all the retarder, it was soft like jello, and you could just take a razor and just scrape it right off. But the cost was this plus, I'm sure his hands turned to alligator skin, but because he wound up salvaging the airplane, it was worth it. And I don't know, I don't think this is the airplane, in fact, it was another one, but what he wound up with is now a really nice looking plane instead of a mess. And I say this to anybody that runs into a problem, when Bill ran into a problem, the first thing he did was call me up. You don't have to call me up. There's, there's literally hundreds of people cross country that know how to finish a plane. And any one of them, I can't imagine they wouldn't be wanting to help you. They're all knowledgeable. You don't get to be an expert without being knowledgeable. You, there's just no way you can do it. Uh, learning all these little mistakes the hard way, nice picture of Mike Dietrich's the bottom of his Cobra. Learning these things the hard way is part of what this whole thing is about. And this trick might save your ass someday, who knows? The old five gallons and five rolls trick. You get the plane down to silver, bare wood, whatever. And this is one of Bill's airplanes. 
and I want to use this for demonstration purposes. When you're spraying on the clear to filler, any of the finish, all of these edges along the flap, the edge along the leading edge, the nose section, the top of the top block, the tip of the rudder, the edge, all the edges will be places where you'll normally wear the paint out. So what I would always be inclined to do is put extra paint on all the edges. I'd also be inclined, let's go back to Bill's airplane, being we're going to beat up on Bill today. When I sprayed my clear, I would spray all the edges extra, all around the trim. Wherever the trim changed color, I would spray extra. The nose extra, because this is the part they're really going to see. The top of the wing they're going to see, the top of the tail. They're really not going to see the bottom. The top, the bottom can be neat and clean and workmanlike, but the top is what they're going to see. You want to get the top nice. You want to do most of your buffing on the top. Now there's a little formula that I worked out to do this. And it's a formula that Bill has used. I think he's used it successfully. Every year he seems to be getting a little bit further up in the rows. And it's a little formula. Another question, very common question you get asked all the time is how much clear to put on a plane? Full size stunt ship, how much clear? Okay, if you start with two quarts of light coat, start with two quarts of thinner, Flexol and fisheye. Okay, this mix, let's call this the mix, will be just over one gallon. Maybe a gallon and a few ounces, this mix. Okay, you now have the amount of clear that should go on a normal stunt ship and give you the correct weight without causing a CG shift. What I do is shake this material up and keep in mind at any point through this you can add thinner or a little bit of retarder to suit the conditions. You just don't add more paint. What I do is get three, I'll just draw these out really rough, like orange juice, gallon jugs. Take the three jugs and split this material equally in the jugs until you have an equal amount of material. And if you follow this formula, you will win every time. The amount in each jug, and they're each equal, is one-third of a gallon of mix. That's exactly the formula that I always use, and it works well. And what you do is you take one jar out, and you use this to do all the letra sets, all the edges, all the places that are going to take a lot of wear, those extra coats around the bays, any bays that you have. You try to level off all your inclines. Now, as an example, here's the plane. We're going to take one third of that material, Go along every time the color changes, just airbrush down the edge, airbrush the edge, airbrush the incline, airbrush over the numbers, airbrush over the word pampa, pampa, airbrush, airbrush, go over the nose, go over this, go over the canopy. Not painting the plane now, just doing edges. One third of the material gets used up doing edges. You now have left two thirds of a gallon. Now you take the two-thirds of a gallon, you come down, and you split this into, take the three jars, because don't forget, one is now empty. Boy, I wish I could be a professional artist. Wall guest, help me out. Okay, you, you divide this into three equal amounts. You have two-thirds of a gallon split in thirds. And you take one-third of this and spray the bottom of the plane, You take two-thirds and spray the top. That formula has been worked out over years and years and years of doing airplanes 
this formula, if you use the whole gallon and sand and buff enough of it off, will add about two and a half ounces to the airplane. Let it dry 24 hours between coats. Add a little thinner if you have to. If you see you're getting fish eyes, put an extra drop of fish eye killer in. If you're using any kind of any kind of open bays or even on foam wing planes, put the flex all in anyway. Keep the finish flexible. Keep it from having the little pits and fish eyes. This formula is not a hit or miss thing. If you do this, you will always wind up with a relatively nice airplane that isn't overweight and doesn't have a tremendous CG shift. And I want to mention another thing while we're getting a little more and a little more involved in this is nitrate dope. This is SIG nitrate. This is not Aerogloss. I'm not going to even discuss Aerogloss. Anybody wants to discuss Aerogloss, call up Billy Suarez. Call up somebody who deals with Aerogloss and get all the latest tricks. I don't use any Aerogloss, have none in the shop. I try to use only SIG. SIG and acrylic are the two materials that I like to use and the candy apple acrylics. SIG nitrate. What could we use SIG nitrate for and use it well? We should have some SIG nitrate in the house anyway. Anyway, this is one of the things we want to use it for. SIG nitrate, anytime you have an airplane, and here's a good example. This is the sidewinder nose. Where you're going to see a lot of, this, this is a line where the plywood ends, where the joint is. You can see the plywood blending in there. Because there's going to be epoxy, hardwood, anything where dope normally can't get a good grip on, or really any tissue, you can use nitrate dope. There's a couple of things to remember about nitrate. Nitrate can be used under, okay, over, never. And I mean never. If you take raw wood, here's that old flat raw wood, you could build up, and I've done that several times, and, and I like to do it in fact, is do the base coats in nitrate, attach the tissue, the tissue will attach better with nitrate, even do the filling with nitrate, right up to the silver. What happens with the silver though, when you spray the silver, you had better not be getting down too deep into this nitrate, where you have big, big caverns going in, or you can loosen this all up. I don't suggest really getting into nitrate unless you're really real familiar with the properties of finishing. Nitrate is good, it's used in free flights, it's lighter than normal dope a little bit, it attaches tissue a little better, it sands a little better. The problem is it's not fuel proof and the problem is if you start sanding down into the nitrate too deep and thinner or you use some high gloss thinner you can wind up with crazing. Crazing is when the finish looks like an alligator skin. Uh, places where the dope will look like a fish eye. You can run into problems when you're at the basic level and since this is the basic video my guess is you should do all your finishing with light coat and save the nitrate for further down the road. Even though there's advantages if you experiment do it with extreme caution. It's a good way to finish an airplane. It's probably uh, a high-tech level way of doing it. I'm not going to get into in this video anyway, maybe we will in the advanced one, dealing with Imrons and epoxies and, and delphanes and acrylics. Let's just keep this to where the average guy who's building his up-and-coming stunner can get a nice finish and not handicap himself by having a sloppy or a twisted or a warped airplane. All right, here's another a way you possibly can use this information, or maybe it'll screw you up. I don't know. Anyway, these are fillets. What I do is I always, and if you look at some of the old Nobler and Sidewinder videos, you'll see I pre-finish up to silver, the wing and the tail. They're in one piece. They're pre-finished up to silver before I join the wing into the body and then the tail on. 
Then what I have to do, I have to build my fillet. In this case, you could use, I used hot stuff in this case, you could use epoxylite. You can carve it out of raw wood. Sidewinder was carved out of one piece of wood and laid in there. No matter how you do it, you're going to have to blend in the silver finish to the raw wood finish. This blend in here. A nice way to do this is with auto primer and an airbrush is to get your fillet in. Now, a fillet, especially an epoxylite fillet, one of the ways that people have used, and I don't like doing it, but it's a legitimate way, is to put some aerogloss on the fillet first to get the SIG to stick to the fillet. A better way, I think, is to just airbrush in coat after coat of auto primer. Auto primer dries. You can use that material I showed before, spot repair thinner. You can airbrush in that fillet over and over and then sand it in with the block with the little curve. Then, of course, you have to dope the body and bring the body up to silver the same way this is. You can see in this picture, there's some little spots, dings that I'm still filling in. What this allows you to do is put the tail in your lap, the wing in your lap. Eh, you can lay it out. You can see I have a table that has a couple of old bed sheets. They're old now. And lay it out and do the sanding here. Once a plane is in one piece, you're always banging into things and hitting things and turning it over and dinging things. At least I do. It's easier to deal with this. Now all I have to do is finish off the body, the canopy, and I'm kind of in good shape. This is a nice uh, a picture of one of Git Atkinson's type of planes. And he has it all assembled. This is the opposite technique, and I want to show them both. He's holding it in an RC kind of a, a mount. And the whole plane is in raw wood. It still has to be covered and tissued and sanded. But I can imagine that this is difficult to work around all these corners and edges. You're always banging into things. I don't know for sure. I, I much prefer this way of finishing. That's my first choice, and that's the way I'd suggest anybody that's going to do it. That's the way I would say give it a try. It's a little more time consuming, but it seems like the overall enjoyment of doing it is a little bit better. And what I want to show on this video too, there's, there's other sources of information. Obviously you can read the magazines, Bob Hunt's column, uh, Frank McMillan's column, they, from time to time will have good finishing tips, tricks, things that they found out worked for them. This is actually one page in the new SIG catalog, and if you don't have a SIG catalog, it's a good investment of a couple of bucks. It has a good description of what all the kinds of dope are and what they're used for and what the advantages, disadvantages are. If you can't afford a spray gun or you don't want to invest in one, they have even a whole list of things that are available in spray cans, in quartz, pints, retarders, light coats, it shows the latest prices. Make sure you have the latest catalog. Don't, don't use one that's a year old because the price of most of these materials changes. This is the latest 1991 catalog, by the way. And in here, there's some excellent information. The back of the gallon cans has some excellent information. You can get the... Uh, I don't like using any of these materials, these sky brights and plasti enamels and all kinds of things. I would, I would suggest you stick with SIG Dope. Uh, anything more complicated than SIG Dope, there's, a, there's more of a risk that you're going to have a problem. But this will give you an idea of what materials you can use, all the, the colors that are available. And there are plenty of colors, believe me. Uh, so I would suggest you can, and you can always get one of these from Pro Stunt Products or from SIG. It's an excellent source of finding things that you may need from time to time. It shows all the kits that are still available, all the latest prices. An excellent thing to have in inventory. There's also some articles up in the front that tell you about wood and about various things that uh, that you may find helpful, sandpaper and dope, finishing. Good idea to get one of these. I'd say that's, if you're new to the hobby, an entry level person, get your hands on a SIG catalog. And no finishing discussion would be complete without a little primer on tape. This is 3M fine line tape. It's light green. And this is 16th. You can see it comes in strips. It makes nice edges. It's got the right stickiness to it for doing trim. It peels up relatively easily without peeling up the paint. Anyway, be aware, not all tape is the same.
Tape is like women. They're all different. Fresh tape, tape that's not a year or two old, is always more desirable than tape that's a year or two old. This is a type, a type of tape that 3M makes. It's white. It's real good for doing trim edges. When you need to do trim edges, it's got about the right kind of glue. The difference in tape is basically, this is a plastic material that bends real nice. I can't show this on camera easy. It bends nice. It gives a nice edge, and it's thick. It tears nice. The fine line is really for doing little stripes and edges. This is another brand of 3M tape. It's called drafting tape. This is very, very weak glue. Excellent for doing repairs where you don't want to pull up fresh paint. It doesn't have a particularly nice edge. The masking tape usually should be sealed with a coat of clear brushed on if you're going to use 3M tape. I wound up going to the store and buying a roll of this. It's called Sure Tape, made in Hickory, North Carolina. This seems like it, uh, in fact, there's a warning right on the label. It says tapes, I'll read it. It says tapes can damage some surfaces. Remove tape within 24 hours or less. Now, I wound up, this wound up being good tape, actually. It was really sticky. Can't even get some of this off now. I did like the way this worked, but it wasn't strong. It did this, it tore. It wouldn't come off in one nice piece. So I kind of gave up on sure tape. It's probably okay for other applications, or I might have gotten an old roll. This is what happens when tape gets old, by the way. Always a good idea. Again, deal with a body shop. Find a body shop in your area and purchase fresh stuff. Now, this is Frost King tape. I bought Frost King tape to try to figure out if I was going to be able to use this to some advantage. Frost King tape is what they use to seal windows up with. And I might have gotten an old roll. I don't want to downplay the product, but I try to get some of this pulled off. And you know, see what happens? It just self-destructs. I'm not even doing this on purpose. What I'd really like to have happen is to be able to tear off one piece nice. Okay, that doesn't look too bad now. Again, this is really super sticky. This will this will pull paint off. So what you do if you're going to have use this is rub it up on your shirt. Take the piece, stick it to a flannel shirt, and pull it off. Make sure there's no fuzz on the edge. Or a t-shirt is good, a clean t-shirt and then lay it down. See, it's really sticky. That's too sticky. You have to do this kind of by feel. But be aware, if you find a brand that you like and works well for you under your shop conditions, go out and buy three or four rolls enough to do an airplane. Then next year when you go to build another plane, buy the tape fresh. Buy it from a place that sells a lot of tape, like a body shop supply. This is a handy material. This is really wide tape. This is handy for masking off air. It's even got the price on it. This is made by Colonial Tape. All right, Colonial Tape. I ran into this problem with Colonial Tape. See, it's coming off two or three layers at a time. It was so sticky, and this is typical of tape that's been sitting on the shelf for a long time. When it sits on a shelf a long time, this is what happens. It's very sticky. You could, you could tow a car with this tape. It's real sticky. The only way I would use this is to rub it up on a t-shirt and take it off. I wouldn't take a chance. This will pull paint off. Uh, one of Paul Walker's planes, I don't remember which one, he had a problem where the paint, the tape was peeling up the paint. It's a shame when you spend all the time and energy uh, that anybody, that it doesn't matter if you're a beginner or an expert, you spend all this time working on an airplane and then to have a two dollar roll of tape destroy it is just unbelievable. It really is frustrating. Anyway, I'm not having good luck with this. Best luck I've had so far is with the 3M tape, the medium stick tape. And all of, the, all of the fine line tapes are just about perfect. You can also buy this masking tape, obviously, in different thicknesses, different glues. Find one that's right for you. Find it, buy it fresh, and I think you'll have real good luck with it. I think this will be just the best of luck. Don't buy old tape and don't store it. If it's a year old, give it to one of your friends like Stifle. Let him worry about it. Don't use it on your own plane. Use it on one of your... Comp give it to Jimmy Casale, even better. Send all your tape that... Uh, <laughs> sorry, Jim. Send it all to Jimmy. It, uh, it'll be very frustrating if you have a, a cheap roll of tape ruin a good airplane.
That is another material you might want to try. Obviously, uh, you have to spend a little time, develop a little technique with it. This is called microflake, micro sequin flake. And what you do with this is you mix, this is a very, very fine powder. You mix a very, very small amount of this in with your clear paint and it puts a nice little sparkle on as you cover it with clear. If you do decide, to, Glenn Metter used to build some real planes with do the whole plane like this. I think a, a whole plane with this is just a little bit too much for my taste, but I like to uh, bring out the benefits of using micro sequin flake. I sold some of this to Cassie Minato last year and he won the goddamn concourse, so Cassie, give me that sequin flake back. Walker had some on his plane that looked real nice too. It's a good way to cover up little mistakes in a plane. If you have a little place on a plane that isn't perfect, a little bit of this flake will cover the grain and cover up the sanding the uh, sanding errors. It's actually a good material to use. It's relatively expensive. You can always get it from Pro Stun Products. The amount you need to do a plane is, is such a small amount that it's unbelievable. Uh, any body shop supply would sell you a big jar like this probably for who knows what. The price goes up every week on this junk and a lot of places have stopped making it. It also comes in silver. It comes in gold. If you need some, you can contact me or I guess anybody. Jimmy Mitchell has access to it too. It comes in silver, it comes in gold. Uh, it's a handy way of jazzing up a relatively uh, mundane plane. You can use it in the lettering, make the canopy. On the Cardinal, the, the green plane that's drying upstairs, I did the canopy with this and it, uh, it looked like it came out real nice. Now these are just some of the parts. The reason I'm doing this, these are the parts of the green plane that's earlier on in the video, the Cardinal Rebuild. What I'm trying to suggest you do is pre-finish any parts you can. This has a pretty nice finish on it right now. Pre-finish any parts separately that you can. These are the wheel pants that go on there. By the way, these are the Brian Ether fiberglass ready to put on wheel pants. They take a nice finish. It uh, might be worth mentioning, these, this is a fiberglass part here. This is the way it comes. And they come from Australia, from Brian Ether. You can get them from Pro Stun Products. You can finish these separately and they attach on to uh, the aluminum gear, Pro Stun aluminum gear. One of the things to remember, and all you have to do is paint these by the way. They come already already ready to put auto primer on. Any part you can finish separately that you don't have to finish um, while it's attached to the plane, you should finish as many parts separately as you can. It's always good technology to try to finish things separately. Whenever you can sort out a part and do it separately, you'll come out way ahead of the game. And you can see these, uh, they can be buffed, sanded, whatever, right out in the open. When they're attached to the plane, you're always banging into things, sticking your fingernail into things. It can just get to be a drag. So my suggestion is if you can make detachable wheel pants, or in this case we have cowlings and tip weight boxes, make as many detachable parts as you can. It just makes it easier to uh, finish the plane in pieces. It's just a time saver if nothing else. This is another cowling to a another airplane that I'm making. This is to a pattern master. And it's easy to get a hold of this. Now this does not have any clear on it yet. It's going to have to be block sanded out of course. And we have another set of uh, the wheel pants. This is going to be painted white. I auto primer at first since it's fiberglass. Any fiberglass parts sand them with 220, 180, whatever. Get them smooth and put on two or three coats of auto primer and you should be all set. Should make it a lot easier for you to do it that way. Auto primer on any fiberglass parts is a nice little trick. Now I'll just spend a few minutes. I'm sure most of the basic people won't be doing Letra sets. I keep a box for all my Letra sets. You won't be, you won't be using a lot, but it'd be nice to have a little introduction to Letra set. These are Tom Lay Letra sets. This is the way they come. You can get them from Pro Stun Products. They're about half of the price they are in a store. In a store, at least in the New York area, a sheet like this would be $10 to $12. They're seven from Tom. Uh, Tom always 
has fresh supply because he doesn't order thousands at a time. These rub on and off real nice. We're going to try to cover more of this in the, uh, the sequel to this, the advanced finishing video. But just to give you a little introduction, this is how a sheet comes. It has all the extra numbers you need. They're all laid out for you. It's a real handy thing to have. I usually keep five or six sheets ready to go. He sends a nice little suggestion tips with them. They come in a nice folder. For $7.95, it's a good investment. Uh, again, this is made by Tom Lay, available from Post on Products. It has all the little letters in emergency and no step and uh, please don't push, no fuel, powered by Super Tiger, all this nonsense on here that you want. You probably should order two or three sheets so that you have extra numbers and extra letters and you want to make up some things. Uh, Tom Lay is just like Wendy. He doesn't know how to spell. You can see there's two M's and no N. Which, uh, Tom, if you're watching, you know, fix that on the next sheet, please. Doesn't bother. I don't know how to spell either. In fact, he spelt his old name here. Tom Lay is L-G-Y. Anyway, no more jokes. They're great things. Use them. Put them to use. Cassie had them on his concourse winner last year. You can see the same. Bill Rich has them on his plane. They're nice to have. Real nice sheet, handy to have. If you're going to go for some Letra sets, a couple of things you might want to have. You notice you can make them up. You can go to and take a Letra set, and this is what Dave Midgley did. You can take a Letra set sheet, take it to any place that does photo transfer, and they can make it in any color you want. Now, see this one, he wrote the word sponsored by Prostone Products. This is his AMA number. And he had the man make him a sheet. The price is usually $20 to $30 but he can make any color to match your plane. So if you really want to be fancy, uh, the first person I knew that did this was uh, Ski did it on his lace maker. And of course you make your own sheet. This one is for Dave Midgley's plane. He wrote out everything he wanted to in the black letter set, then bring that as a, as a photo ready copy. And oh, of course here's the copy. So we can show how this is done. Or you can just buy Letra sets. If you don't want to buy Tom Lay Letra sets, you can just go to the store and buy Letra sets, just ordinary old Letra sets. They're generally really expensive, $12 and up a sheet. Keep in mind, here's one thing to really keep in mind, though. I really don't want to skip over this too much. Don't use old ones. Try to get fresh ones. When they get a year old, it seems like mm, you got to press halfway through the plane to get them to come out, and you get Letra dents instead of Letra sets. Another trick with Letra sets is to pre-release them. We're going to go into some of that in the advanced video. They come, and you can see how many I have here. There's all different styles, all different sizes, all different numbers, all different colors. They come, I mean, just virtually anything you can want, Letra set will make you. You can get these. Art Supply Store is the place to get them. Practice on something other than your best plane. You can see I have a whole box of them here. There's, there's hundreds of sheets of them. I probably have about $1,000 worth in this box. Now what we do with this box that's real nice in the East Coast, there's just, just hundreds of them in here. It doesn't even pay to take them out. What we do with this is we pass this box around. Last year Bill Simons went to make his shoestring. He bought some Letra sets, put the leftover ones in this box. Uh, Jeff Stifel built his plane, put the leftover ones. Here's all the little decals for up around the nose. We were saving these nose steps and everything. We have a box to trim out airplanes. And whoever's at the point that they're going to trim out a plane, they, they borrow <coughs> the box from Wendy that has all of this stuff in it. And, of course, the saving in money is astronomical because... You don't want to buy a whole sheet just because you need one extra A or B or C or D. So having a box like this of all the Letra sets that you'll need, even though there's an investment here of probably a thousand bucks maybe, this is something you need if you're going to decorate airplanes with Letra sets. And anybody that wants to borrow this, just send me 20 bucks and they can borrow it. Huh, just kidding, send 50. Another thing we're going to touch on and not get a big involved thing, it is inclines. Not going to get too heavily involved right now, but we have, again, a box. And again, all the things you would typically need to do inclines. Triangles. All these little drafting squares. You can buy these in an art supply store. 
French curves. This is the pattern for making part of the cardinal. This is the pattern for making the cardinal's head. Pattern for the incline on the nose of the plane. All right, let's talk about this. This is a simple thing. We want to do an incline, and I don't want to have a joint in it. I want rounded edges and not corners. So I make a piece of 64th plywood, smooth the edges off, and then lay tape in it. You can see there's tape almost up to the edge so ink doesn't run underneath. Then I cut a hole and tape this right to the side of the plane in position. And I just go right around it in one stroke, peel it off, and I'm done. But of course you need a pattern for every ink line. Sounds like time consuming and it is. Sometime if you want to be in the front row it takes a lot of time and energy. Same thing I put tape on these uh, templates. One of the nicest ink line jobs I've ever seen is on Ted's plane. He, uh, he must have thousands of these. There's all kind of little intricate designs. Looks real neat. And I save all the old ones. Here's the bird's head from the original Cardinal with the tapes peeling off and the eye is in the wrong spot and everything. Again, make the patterns up. One of the things you're going to need, uh, more bird's heads, more Cardinals, is a set of ink pens. Now I found this set, this is Stead ladder. This is about a $70 set of pens. They're all gone. People have borrowed them and never returned them. And then I have a box of ink. This is the ink line from the nose of the sidewinder. More French curves. Ink. Real important to remember. Hey, you have two kind of inks. No matter what brand you buy, you have a brand of ink that's made to go on paper and a brand that's made to go on mylar acetate, aha, uh -huh. it's, it's blacked out, acetate ink and paper ink. Acetate ink is the kind you want if you're going to buy it. Acetate ink will make your life a lot easier. Little template for doing a shield that's on the cardinal. Any number of pens and doodads and you can buy these pilot pens that will write right on a plane. You don't even have to refill the ink. The trouble is they're a little sloppy. You have the tool for putting on the letter sets. We're going to try to get into some of this in, in the advanced video. Right now, I, don't, I think you should just know about this and not get too carried away about it. Just know that it exists and know how to, uh, how to evaluate it. Now, what I just did, I just got a set of these pens from Jeff Stifel. These are a more expensive brand of pen. Conior, Rapidograph. These pens work outrageous. These are the best pens I've ever had. A couple of problems. The ink they sell you with them is ink for paper, so I just replaced that with acetate ink. This is the nicest set of pens you can buy. I don't know what the price is. You probably really only need one or two. Uh, I have just, this just been a joy inking out a plane with these nice pens. This is really the best set I could recommend. And one of the things we just spent a second or two talking about, and we this this will be the crux of the second video, is buffing out a plane. This seems to be the most baffling part of all finishing. One of the things to keep in mind with buffing, just like wood, is flat. What we're looking for is a flat surface. Once we have that flat surface, from sanding the wood, applying the dope, sanding it, whatever, we're going to have layer after layer of dope, what we need to do is buff it. Now buffing, well let's describe what steps I would take anyway. I would sand the surface with 1200 sandpaper until it's flat, dull. The next step would be to, you could either try rubbing compound and that would come in red or white. Red is rough, white is smooth. Either one of those would be acceptable. Or Gorham Silver Polish. You can get, if, you can get Gorham Polish in the in a A&P, the food store. If you can't, you can get it from Pro Sun Products, of course. Gorham Silver Polish. Now what these are, and you can even use toothpaste, 
all they really are, in a real pinch, you could use newspaper. In fact, Ski told me he buffed his whole plane out with newspaper. What is all of these materials, the 1200, the rubbing compound, the Gorham's toothpaste, all they do is polish. All they are is, re in reality, polishing. A lot of waxes have polish in them, too. They're made to bring up the shine. They'll all do it in various ways. One of the most important things to remember with any finish, though, is let it dry. You hear from guys all the time that say, I sprayed my plane Saturday, it looks great. I sanded it Sunday. I went to buff it Monday, it looks like crap. Let it dry. Six weeks. Put it by the heating vent in the house. Let that finish dry out and harden up. It's going to shine relative to the paint's hardness. As paint ages, it hardens. As it hardens, it'll take a shine easier and hold it longer. Hardness is what we're after. This is the reason most epoxy finishes don't look as good as lacquer finishes or dope finishes. Epoxy always stays a little soft. It never really has the deep glow of a lacquer finish. The hardness. As dope ages, it hardens. As lacquer ages, it hardens. Four to six weeks later, you buff it out. It'll buff out a lot easier. It'll sand easier. It won't clog up the paint. I know it's hard. You want to see that airplane shiny right away. But you should wait. Let it dry. This is the trick to this. Let it dry, let the dope get hard, and then buff it. Don't rush. When you rush, you get frustrated, the sandpaper gets clogged up, you go crazy. Again, it's redundant to say this, but there's a complete video of buffing. All the, the tricks and tips right at the end of the Sidewinder said, borrow it from somebody. There's hundreds of sets of those videos out in the real world. Call around and you'll find somebody that has a set you can borrow if you don't want to buy them. It's, uh, there's not too many people that haven't seen the Nobler or the Sidewinder videos yet. Either borrow them or buy your own set. But check out the technology. It's there for you. This is one of the only events that we have that you can get this kind of information firsthand uh, it's a shame that uh, it's so hard to get information. It's just, uh, when I was coming up through the ranks, it was impossible to get this. You had to find it out for yourself. It was like pulling teeth. You had to assassinate people to find out how to buff out a finish. Finally, you did find a few people that were helpful, like Harold Price or, uh, oh, geez, any number of guys, John DeTavio or whatever, that would just share the information they learned with you. But buffing out a plane, when you get to be an expert, you're going to have to do it, like it or not. Speaking of being an expert, whether it takes you one year, ten years, or in my case, a lifetime, to become an expert. When you're an expert and you're competing against the top level flyers in the country and the world, and you want to do well, you want to strive to get 20 appearance points. And what I'm going to say in the next couple of minutes is going to piss off a lot of people, but it's too bad. More gnats have been lost because people didn't have, the, or lost, or people that haven't made the top five cut by people that had 12 and 10 appearance points. When you take that eight point handicap, that's a tremendous handicap. The gnats are won and lost by a point, point and a half. You can't trade away eight points. So the trick is, early on in your career, early on in your, your, your event development, realize that having top appearance points is an important thing. It's not a subtle thing. Uh, I could name at least three or four Nats that I've been to that the person who won or didn't win, won or didn't win because of appearance points. And I could name at least 30 or 40 people that missed the top 20 cut because so and so had 8 points more than they did or 5 points more or whatever. Appearance points when you're an expert are absolutely important. Absolutely. There's no way, I mean you can name people that have won the Nats. I believe Gieske is one of them and other people that have won with 10 or 12 appearance points. But when you balance it against the amount of people that haven't won like Gene Schaefer and other people 
that could have won three or four times had they had top appearance points. It doesn't balance out. It always pays to have the appearance points. It always pays to let the other person have the handicap. And let's face it, you want to be an expert. This is, this is a no-nonsense hobby. You want to move right on, get on with it, learn how to build well, even if not for your own satisfaction. Let the other guy have the handicap. Let him go in with 12 appearance points or monocoat wings or whatever, whatever, you know, no ink lines. Having a shiny plane is worth, another word, it's probably spelt wrong. It's an intangible. Anybody that judges will tell you, oh no, we don't look at the finish, we only look at the airplane. Bullshit. They look at the shiny plane, you have a shiny plane, they're going to take you serious. Bill Rich is a good example of that. Let's go back to Bill. When he was flying dull, not that good looking planes, he never got taken seriously. He came out with a shiny plane, bingo, top 20. People that have suffered by having trashy looking airplanes know how frustrating it is. Well, the answer is take advantage of the intangible. And believe me when I tell you, a shiny plane buys you an intangible thing it's like not being fat, having a haircut, looking like you're a professional, intangible. You go to the Nats with long hair and earring, a shirt that doesn't match your plane, it's an intangible thing, you're not going to do well. Go there with a shiny plane, a white shirt, and don't have your gut hanging out, you're going to take advantage of that intangible. All of the people I know that are doing well look professional, have nice appearing planes. Look at the top the top 20 fly off. You don't see a lot of trashy looking planes or monocoat planes. It's an intangible thing. And and needless to say, virtually everybody that's won in that's in the time I've been around has done it with a nice looking airplane. I can't remember one person that had a plane that was really a piece of trash. It takes time, it takes effort, it's an intangible thing. Having a nice shiny plane is worth it. Let's see if that's spelt right. Definitely worth it. No question about that it's worth it. Now, one of the other things you need to have constantly while you're finishing planes is inspiration. And there's a few minutes left on this video. I'm going to finish it up by showing you some different pictures of planes that should give you a little bit of an inspiration give you some ideas on how to finish some color schemes and if you're interested in this kind of information the next video in this series is going to be the advanced one we'll try to get into a little more high-tech stuff a little more inspiring stuff this is the thing you come away from the video uh, I think more than anything else realizing that it is worth it when you get in that front row it's always worth it you win the concourse, it's definitely worth it. This was the first year I won the concourse, 1985, the Killer B. I was real happy with this. All the work I put into this plane paid off every time I look at that trophy up in the living room, and I have two of them. Worth it. Keep in mind, worth it.
Thank you.